You're listening to the No Labels, No Limits podcast with best-selling author Sarah Box, where you get the inside scoop on the steps action takers and decision makers take to align their purpose to their principles and achieve their goals in business and life. We focus on the mantra, no labels, no limits, no excuses. And now, without further ado, please welcome your commanding coach with plenty of chutzpah and heart, Sarah Box. There is a vitality, a life force, an energy, a quickening that is translated through you into action. And because there is only one of you in all time, this expression is unique. And if you block it, it will never exist through any other medium and it will be lost. Martha Graham, welcome to the No Labels, No Limits podcast. I'm Sarah Box. Your host, I am so glad to welcome you back to this week's episode because you know that we are on a mission to help individuals, teams, and organizations think outside the box, move beyond limiting beliefs, and create a profound impact in the lives of others as well as themselves. And we do that through sharing accomplished and inspiring guests who have challenged limiting beliefs and labels on their own path and accomplished so much as a result. So get ready. Um, I'm so happy to be interviewing Yole Berla Buccellete, an expert in trauma-informed coaching and short-term therapy with a unique blend of brain-based techniques and a background as a psychotherapist and MA in music therapy. Actually, her background is really diverse, so that explains she has a very holistic approach to her work. And her journey is a fusion of diverse disciplines, ranging from biology, anthropology, music, to dance and body work. And her expertise has culminated in an integral short-term coaching concept that integrates these methods um, and really creates a trauma-informed and highly effective approach. She's the author of the impactful book, Sing From Your Core, and her methods have empowered and inspired highly sensitive highly intelligent and highly empathic change leaders. So that's a lot of accomplishment. Um, And those folks have often had to navigate their own challenges due to their unique nervous system wiring, which we're going to find out more about, and to find support and transformation through Yoli's innovative approach. So today I'm going to talk with Yoli about the quote we led off with, the various types of HSP, highly sensitive persons, each type's kind of challenges and gifts, and why Yoli considers HSPs as the quote-unquote missing link in the transformation of our society. I'm super excited to talk to Yoli any chance I get, and I know that you're really going to love her. So with that, let me welcome Yoli to the podcast. How are you doing? I'm fine, Sarah. I'm so happy to be here with you and to continue our talk in this way. <laughs> so, yeah, we spent like 15 minutes just dabbing before I went, oh, yeah, we're supposed to do a podcast interview. <laughs> so you might guess, Yoli's in Berlin, she, Berlin, right? Is that where you are right now? Well, actually, I'm in Hamburg, Germany. Okay. Okay. Almost. I've moved you into a different city, but you're still in Germany. You're ahead of me in timeline. So she's gracious enough to be doing this interview at 8.30 her time, closer to 9 now at night. Um, so after a day of her doing impactful work in the world, you'll I'd like to start just by asking you why that quote means so much to you. Well, being a highly sensitive person um, and having worked with a lot of highly sensitive people, um, being fully alive, being fully who we are is one of the biggest challenges. And Martha Graham, you know, having been a dancer, Martha Graham was very important to me. This vitality, this life force she's talking about is really what needs to be rediscovered, rekindled and empowered in a lot of highly sensitive people and a lot of um, high potential people. Because so many of us have been told that there's something wrong with us, that, you know, we, we cannot function correctly. Um, that we're the odd ones out and that does something you know to our self-esteem and Martha Graham is really in that quote is inviting us hey guys you're needed (laughs) 
yeah, your gift is needed and um, show up. And that's why I like that quote so much. It's a very um, inviting and liberating quote. But also, mm. it isn't like a just think about it quote. It's like, get going. We need you. you know? <laughs> like, Dancer, get going. Yeah, move. We need you. We need your move. art and your grace and your contribution. So yeah, you, your expression. We need your expression. Yeah, we need you to to not show up intellectually, but show up with your love, with who you are fully. I yeah. think, and and I don't want to make too many generalizations, but uh, sometimes I do though. Um, but when I'm going to broadly say artists and creatives, which I know not everyone in that group is highly sensitive, but when for me, the value of people who are highly creative is they can communicate without words oftentimes in ways that you know your soul just goes, that's it. That's exactly what I'm trying to express, only I didn't have that means, right? So it's almost like it unlocks the door to other parts of ourselves. Yeah, it deeply does. It deeply does. And that's why, you know, if you take creativity out of the system like for example in, in, in the German school system they've almost eradicated it um, you know you have one hour of arts class or you know one hour of music a week and we know from neuroscience that that is the biggest mistake you can actually make in educating people is to take art and creativity out of the equation Really what bad. happens when we do that? I mean, that there's been that here in the States, too, Yoli. I mean, really, there used to be a lot more in the schools than there is. and so. But what happens as a result of that? Because you talked about the science around that. Well, it's like part of um, finding solutions, solving problems, being in the world, engaging, communicating with others, with life, um, gets taken out of the equation. So um, there's this wonderful book um, that's called um, The Master and His Emissary by Ian McGilchrist. And he talks about, it's a huge, thick book, and I love it. Um, and it talks about the left and the right brain. And, it, um, and it's really about saying that our linear analytical brain that, that forms categories and that thinks that it understands everything is really the servant and the master is broadly speaking the right hemisphere yeah the right brain it, it, it's not that simple but you know for the moment let's just say it that way um and who's deeply connected to our creativity to um our bodies to communication and that is what art fosters in schools yeah um, it fosters teamwork a lot of times. It fosters seeing and sensing and feeling the word feeling. Yeah, it's almost a dirty word sometimes. The world around us and ourselves. So you can imagine what damage happens to human beings if they are not allowed or trained to go there. To go to all those parts of themselves? To go to those parts of themselves, yeah. And for highly sensitive people, it's the worst thing that could possibly happen because that's the way they deeply function. Let's yeah. let, let's talk a bit about how highly sensitive persons function, and maybe you could educate us on that because my knowledge is a thimbleful to what you know, and I want to assume I know zip bitty doo da. So, <laughs> give us some background on that and information, please. So. Um, of course, there's a lot to be said, and there's a lot more to know than I know, I'm sure. Um, and, you know, highly sensitive people are usually talked about about the negative aspects of being a highly sensitive person, meaning, um, you know, they're easily overstimulated. They are, they, um, because of their depths of processing in some things, they are they need more time than other people. And then their ability to sense the subtle for many people is just a pain in the neck because it means that there will be discussions about things that a lot of people will say, well, that is not important. Um, 
and you know the food sensitivities the sensitivities to noise and to crowds that's what you usually hear um and that i think is is severely unfair because of two things one is that a lot of what seems to be negative about highly sensitive people is actually due to trauma because when you I studied trauma very deeply having you know done a certification in, in trauma therapy and it occurred to me at a certain point I said oh look I mean if I take these things then it's almost one-to-one -one, uh, the signs of trauma so what would happen if we actually take that out of the equation and then see what remains and what remains is people who are able to think in very complex systems that enjoy thinking in complex systems they love being in community they are really really good at communication they are many times not all of them you know very empathic people um they thrive if you give them a problem and say give me a solution because they are so you know the creativity is um I had put a quote here, you know, that creativity is more about being able to see a problem and solve it in a creative way rather than just being an artist. Yeah. So um, these are all aspects that usually get lost in in that, oh, you're sensitive and, you know, you can come, cannot come and to the party. You don't like to go to the discotheque. You don't like to smoke. You, you know, blah, 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 yaddy, yaddy, yaddy kind of thing. So maybe that answers a bit of your question. It does answer it. Um, I'm laughing because all those things, it's like, oh, no, they're not drinkers. They're not smokers. Don't invite them, right? But I think, but what I'm really hearing you say, and the yada, 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 because when I say that, my husband goes, do people really say that? And I said, oh, we do. <laughs> you know, it's like, I'm not going into all of it, but you know where the conversation goes. Mm -hmm. But when you talk about the problem solving, and then also just before that, you had talked about how people consider them to kind of them being HSPs to kind of be a pain, right? Because you want to get quickly to something. You don't want to have these side conversations. I wonder when we do that, when we go too quickly and we don't take time to listen, mm -hmm. we're not getting anything new, though. We're just getting the answers or the solutions that we anticipate or think we want to get anyway. Is that fair to say? Yeah. Yeah, that is fair to say. And I think that, you know, I'm, you know, I do work with business people sometimes. Um, so I'm, you know, I'm not a business coach in that sense, but the, the, um, what I read is that that is one of the big problems in business that people that are, are there to take decisions are under time pressure and they're under the pressure to make you know, to produce money, yeah, profit. And very often they don't take the time to actually understand that they are confronted with a dynamic, complex system. And um, that that actually needs to be looked at from different angles. It needs to include the past, the present, and the future. It needs to include the people that are customers the people that are producing it and and so on um and that the time you know i definitely feel that now the time for quick fixed solutions um that takes no hostages is over yeah our 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 world cannot um survive if you continue to base our business and political and social decisions on quick fixes and linear thinking. Well, let's talk more about that, because I know in one of the things you'd mentioned directly in conversation with me, and then I think I put it into like your little introduction, is really how you see HSPs as being essential for change making. Will you yeah. share some more of your thoughts around that? Yeah, sure. I'd love to. Um, so. It's actually that I, I think that the skills that highly sensitive people have that I mentioned are what I call that missing link for, um, 
what I would call a positive change in our society. Now, some people probably wouldn't agree with me, but, you know, in, in my narrative, um, it would be a kinder world. Yeah, human kind, a kinder human um, race on for the planet and for everybody else. Um, and maybe I have to, 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 you know, widen the circle a bit here. So that is one aspect that I think that we actually need to shape up and contribute. We need to to step out of that victimhood or I'm a pure, poor HSP and I cannot handle overstimulation and I've been bullied and I've been misunderstood and, you know, I have, you have all my sympathy really, but it's, you know, time to get over that and to contribute with our skills and our talent to a better world. So that sounds very idealistic, but um, I honestly think that that's the challenge. Um, that is, that's what's being asked of highly sensitive people. So if you think highly sensitive people are always roughly 20% of the population, uh, more or less the same amount of males and females, and it seems, at least that's what I've read in the research, that in history that's been a pretty stable percentage. And in other cultures, highly sensitive people are the shamans, they are the wise people, they are the, the ones that are being listened to because they have these capacities. Um, why aren't we as a society? And then to answer the second part of what you said, that I think there is a significant group of highly sensitive people that, um, what's the English word, um, that, 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 who are change makers, yeah, who define as people who don't just want to contribute, to change or support others, but that actually have a mission, that see that they have a specific way of looking at something and a specific solution and trajectory that they want to bring to this world. And those are the ones that I feel more passionate about, you know, to support and help them to, um, to overcome all the doubts because, you know, intelligent people and people that are able to think in complex ways, they come up with problems other people would not even dream of. <laughs> you know, I cannot, but this is difficult, but, you know, this is so complex. How could I possibly, you know? Um, yeah, and that keeps keeps that group of people from, from moving as we talk, you know, bringing Martha Graham's idea of their own vitality, their own spark, their own energy. Um, you mean because of the overwhelm of how large the problem is or how yeah. complex? Many times it's yeah. it's that or it's, you know, having been bullied or not having been, um, you know, taught to, to know their value um, because they seem to not be able to find community. That's a huge problem. Yeah. Um, and many of the ideas that highly sensitive people want to bring to this world require a group. They require community and collaboration. And we are, I feel sometimes we are just at the brink of where our society is actually understanding that. But um, if, you know, if you go back in time in our society, a lot of highly sensitive people um, were loners. Yeah. They couldn't find their tribe and, and their energy got lost in one way or another. Hey there, everybody. I want to take just a minute out of this episode of the No Labels, No Limits podcast to tell you that we are officially opening the Sandbox membership in September. So if you're not already on our mailing list, please click the link below to either sign up for the membership or get on the waiting list for the membership. And if you click the link, you'll find more information about what's included, what our plans are, and better yet, you'll be on early enough to help decide what is most important to you to experience in the first three to six months of the membership. So don't wait. Click the link below and join us in the sandbox where fun happens. We get to do a little R&R, &R, little learning, support one another, 
and really grow and expand in ourselves, in our lives, and impact the world in a profound way. So come on over, join us. So let's talk about the spectrum. Because if someone's listening to this and they're saying, you know, like you've described maybe how people might show up and they say, well, sometimes like I'm sensitive to noise or this situation and that situation. Does that by default make me highly sensitive or is there a spectrum? How might I know that it's like maybe I, it's a situation that I'm not able to deal with or whatever? So help us out. What is a spectrum and how might someone know whether they're a highly sensitive or where they are along that? Yeah, okay, sure. Um, first of all, though, we have to define something else um, or separate something. So, you know, as I said before, a lot of the characteristics that occur as a problem are very similar or the same that people that carry a lot of trauma have. So when I, when I have a client in front of me, I at the beginning, I actually try and determine, um, is there trauma? And if yes, how much? Because um, sometimes trauma mimics high sensitivity. Yeah. Mm -hmm. Or, you know, some people are highly sensitive, but if we want to express it that way, 30%. Yeah. And if they carry trauma, they might come across as somebody who is ca carries 80% of the characteristics of a highly sensitive person. Because so of the trauma overlay? Exactly. Okay. Yeah. So let's, let's say, for example, for people to understand, if you've had, let's say, a dad who was violent, verbally violent, was screaming a lot, a lot of these people are very sensitive to sound. Yeah, especially, no, you know, sudden noises or, you know, any kind of um, noise that really gets to you. But it's not a function of high sensitivity in that case. It's a function of trauma. So that needs to be as much as possible distinguished. Okay. If we have established that somebody, you know, and ticks a lot of the boxes of high sensitivity, um, it occurred to me that the people that were in front of me had, let's say, different talents and different challenges. For example, um, there are people that tick a lot of the boxes of high sensitivity, but they're not highly empathic. Yeah, and many times um, that is, to my, in my regard, is being mixed up. High sensitivity and high empathy is not necessarily the same thing. So somebody who is highly empathic and highly sensitive actually has a double problem, a double whopper, basically. Yeah. Um, so they get a two for one. Yeah, they get a two for one. And some people get a four for one. <laughs> yes. oh, or a five for one, not four for one, probably. Um, then the other thing is that almost all highly sensitive people carry this urge to um, improve things, yeah, because they sense what the problem is. They, they sense the elephant in the room. So, you know, and because they like complex thinking, they say, but look, I mean, the solution would be, for example, you know, being creative. Um, that's one thing. The other thing is if you have that impulse of being a change maker, you have that oomph, you have that chutzpah, yeah, to say, I want to really do something about this. Not all highly sensitive people are like that. So if you're highly sensitive, highly empathic, and a change maker, you've got the, whatever you call it, the triple whopper. <laughs> yeah. And then you have, you know, some highly sensitive people are introverts, others are extroverts. It's a minority, but it exists. So it's a different expression of it. Yeah, um, and that's why somehow I'm missing one. Which one did I miss? I can't remember now, isn't that strange? But anyway, so, you know, I call it a spectrum because there's anything in between, okay? Um, it's not like 
I actually described it as a pentagram, and you can be in that pentagram. You can be anywhere with any combination. Yeah. Mm -hmm. um, and it, I, I find it very helpful when I work with clients to actually find out if they have a challenge, if they have a problem, what is it actually based on? So I try not to make too many assumptions about what kind of HSP they are. Yeah. I mean, you can even have HSP narcissists. So you wouldn't find a very high degree of empathy there, but they actually use the same antennas. They use the same skills. By but, yeah, different what's reasons. the elephant in the room? They manipulate people because they have these antennas. Yeah. So interesting. Okay, so when someone comes to you, well, I have two competing questions. One moment. Let me just decide where I'm starting. Okay. I'll put them both down. Okay, so I want to back up. I know you don't work with businesses all the time, mm -hmm. but honestly, I could convince you to work with a business. So pretend you're working with me, and I have a team, and I don't necessarily know what's going on, but I want to be aware of if, like, someone on my team is highly sensitive or they're being steamrolled or whatever, but so that they're included, like, so that we are not as a group missing out on insights that we could be missing out on if we're not, if our antenna as teammates and managers and owners are not aware. So how would we, or how might you suggest folks who are having teams, sometimes many, many people, sometimes just a handful, kind of think about this and how to include and lift up those innate qualities in folks? Does that question make sense to you, Yoli? Yeah, yeah, it makes sense to me. Um, where am I going to start? So one thing is to actually look out for the people that are quiet. Look out for the people that are watching other people in the sense of you can actually see that they listen to what's being said. Um, um, listen to their answers. If they get a chance to answer, um, you know, if you have a room full of people that shout me, shout me, 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 me first, it's, it's very difficult for highly sensitive people to raise their voices because what they're going to say is not going to be a quick fix. Yeah. So listen out for people that will say, well, the situation is like this and like this and like that. And a possible, possible solution would be. Yeah, something like that, for example. Um, watch out for people that are actually interested in real teamwork and not just putting themselves first. The way I, I, I the picture that came to me when you asked me that question, you know, being a musician, <laughs> um, I saw um, an, um, a score in front of me, a score of a big piece of music, yeah, where you have several instruments. And if you, let's say, um, you have a symphony, yeah? Sometimes it's one instrument that plays the melody and then another instrument picks it up and then another instrument does something completely different. But you have that complex structure of harmony. And many times I find in these meetings, you, you, you possibly have a piano and a singer and everybody falls off the chair other than realizing that you actually have a comp if you have a larger team a complex score in front of you and that if you disempower and disallow certain colors and voices you will never get the full picture and you will never get the beauty of the whole score maybe that's the best way i can put it that is such a great metaphor such a great metaphor because you can if you're listening to a full symphony and all of a sudden the horns are gone you notice there's a gap. But if the horns never come in, you don't know there's a gap. And you could think by the end of the symphony, like, well, that was pretty good, but not as full as it might have been, right? Our solution was okay, but yeah. not quite right. So I think we can notice things when they're missing, but if they're never allowed to show up, how do we notice when they're gone? Well, you notice it really by the end result in the way as you you know suggested and um let's say um 
you have, um, you know, what you usually have in a choir, four voices. Yeah, and it's, um, if one voice is missing, the piece doesn't work. It will have some sort of result. It will maybe mm -hmm. please some people, but it will not, you know, somehow you would say, well, where's the soprano? Or, you know, in, in the picture, that maybe the soprano, you know, we, we are always divas, right? So, but if you... Hey, I was never a soprano. I was lower. So, <laughs> yeah, never but a diva. See, if the second voice, the second soprano alto is missing, so many times the beauty of the music actually comes from the alto. The complexity, the warmth, the the um, contrapunct, I forgot what you, how you call that in English, comes from the tension between the soprano and the alto, yeah? And if you don't have the bass that gives that, you know, orientation, harmony, yeah. if you take that out, okay? And that's what I, to my, to my knowledge, happens in a lot of those meetings. You have a male or a female soprano going, <laughs> and everybody else is supposed to shut up. <laughs> Go along and, with it. Yeah, or go along with it, and it's yeah. boring. You know? Well, it's boring, but often you come out. Those are the meetings when I've personally been in them, and I'm thinking we could have gone without this meeting. Nothing's changed. We've just yeah. talked about the same things again. Come out with the same. Okay, we're going to keep going. It's like, what was the point? But the we point didn't really is, listen to everybody. So, yeah. I, but I think meeting carrying that metaphor is, is important mm -hmm. for us. Mm. I'm sorry, I didn't mean to cut you off. No, I'm sorry, I did actually. Um, the point of those meetings is made to make the soprano look good all the time. Yeah. <laughs> I'm sorry, I almost, I was drinking some coffee. I, that almost came out my nose. So, and, you know, that's fine. That's perfect. Soprano, but it doesn't get you anywhere. You know, it's the same old song as you said. <laughs> yeah. Oh my God, that was funny to me. Okay. I'm with you. Okay, listeners, we're going to get back on track here. Um, so when you start working with someone, which is my other question beyond the business, mm -hmm. I come to you and you're going to try and discern if I've got an overlay of trauma or what's going on with me so that you're seeing me as a unique person, correct? Right. Okay, yeah. you get that figured out. What are we doing? How do you help me kind of get out of I'm going to use this word, I'm not sure you would use it, but the chains that my beliefs, maybe my even victimhood or past experiences had led me to believe are my limits. How do you help me kind of break out of that and think differently and honor myself maybe more the way Martha Graham would want me to honor myself? Hmm. Yeah, yeah, thanks for looping back to Martha Graham. So um, she's also so important because... Um, let me tell you the, the story. I had, you know, one client um, that a lot of times the first question I ask is, what's your joy? What do you like? What makes you feel alive? And this client looked at me and she had had a lot of therapy before and she said, there was a pause and then she said, you know, you're the first therapist who's ever asked me that question. Yeah, and it is my firm belief, and you know, there's also a psychologist called positive psychology, where I then later found validation for what I was doing. Um, is that you need to move from the goal is not to get rid of a problem, but the goal is to live your life fully, and that's why I like that episode. And you talked with Misha Rubin so much because he talks about exactly that same thing. Yeah. And so that is the base from where I start. And I always keep returning to that question. Where are we with that? And is that still, you know, where your joy would be? So that's the very first step that move from limitation to opportunity and not fixing problems. Do you find people have trouble? I mean, if you were to ask me that out of the blue, it would be hard for me to answer that question, especially if I wasn't anticipating it. It'd be like, what? To your clients, then it's like, you're the first person to ask them. It's like, what? So do people tend to know right off the bat what their joy is and just maybe have been suppressing it? or? Um, 
it sometimes it takes a moment, but most people know in their heart. Okay. They're just waiting for the permission to say it, and then you get yes, but, yes, but, yes, but, and the buts are the, li- the limiting beliefs, or is the trauma, is what what then needs to be worked through. Um, but if the goal is to fix a problem, you will fix problems until you die, because there are always problems. Um, and the human brain actually works. I mean, there's science on this, that if you have a motivation, you will do all kinds of things to reach that goal. But if you are, your motivation is to fix something that's wrong, you're not motivated. And there are many things in the therapeutic or the coaching process you actually, you just won't do because you don't feel like it. Whereas, if you have that, you know, that's the life. That's who I am. That's my spark where I'm going to discover what my spark is. You know, you're engaged. Even if you're scared, even, you know, if you're bitter, even if you're disappointed, even um, if people told you that you are this, that, and the other, you would say, yeah, yeah. I want to heal. I want to know who I am. Um and then once we've established that um, base, I, for example, look at what's the HSP blueprint. Yeah, what what type of person are you, or you believe that you are, because that sometimes changes. Um, and then we use that as a platform to say, okay, so um, if you are, for example, um, highly sensitive meaning you have depth of processing, you react to overstimulation, you are emotionally very reactive, much more than other people. Like, for example, I you know, I watch a movie and I sit there and I cry and I cry and my husband will look at me, what's the problem? <laughs> yeah. It's just it's just the way I am. And then the last one is, you know, sensing subtle things. If you have all these four elements, but you're also highly empathic, um a lot of times you will actually need to teach you um, not to always be in other people's space, not to be so people pleasing, not to put other people's emotions first, because that's what highly empathic people do. Yeah, they say, oh, poor you. Okay, I'll help you. And then I won't have time for my own things. Never mind. And if you're highly sensitive, you actually feel what the other person needs. And then you take it on as your own baggage. So that needs to be looked at. Is that how you're going to, you know, do have emotional, mental, and energetic hygiene when you're around other people, and so on. So is that part of it? Um, I, I just can't help when you talk. I see images of things, of, and I just when you were talking about the energy or being highly empathic and being around people, especially if you can sense what they need. Do you? Help people identify. I'm sorry, I'm just going into my own lingo right now, which is not yours. But I th- sometimes think that folks who identify, so say you're the empathic person, someone else you're picking up on, right? They know that, right? So they're what I would call like an emotional vampire. They're going to use you to deal with them because, so they don't have to deal with themselves. Um, so do you help people? Hmm? That is the plight of a lot of highly sensitive people. They get into a codependency with narcissists. <laughs> so it's exactly what you described. Yeah. Okay. Thank you for the real language, not the psychic vampire. But yes, I mean, I can see it. You know, it's easy to see that. And you're thinking, ooh, that is a dangerous dance that's happening there. Yeah. It's a very dangerous dance and it comes out of not knowing your value. Yeah. And maybe if you could address that too briefly that, you know, because you know, you, you you mentioned that integral approach that I developed, that I believe that there are actually four levels that need to be addressed in varying degrees for each individual. Or actually, I think um, I talked to a friend about this, a business friend, that that would be an interesting idea to actually also do with teams. So these four levels are the body, the physical level. So how does the body react? What kind of memories does the body have? What joy does the body actually have and want? Yeah. Then there's the mind. What are my beliefs? 
what are my toxic beliefs, what are beliefs that actually are a resource, yeah? What kind of beliefs did I take from my family or society that keep me from showing my light, yeah? For example, I'm a woman, so I can't do blah, 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 yeah? The next one is the emotional level, which is your feelings. Um, like if you carry a lot of anger or you think, and you know, you don't know how many people, especially women that are not able to express anger. Yeah. If you cannot feel and express anger, you have a problem. So sometimes I sit in front of me and say, oh, but I can't put all that anger in front of you, you know, just spill it in the room. And I said, look, I've done karate for many years. You believe there's there were huge blocks standing in front of me, <laughs> punching in my face. I can deal with your aggression, you <laughs> know, sweat. <laughs> I can deal with that. So, and the last level is actually the one you mentioned, and that is um, the energetic level, which for highly sensitive people is very, very important because if you don't, accept or in some ways use that concept of energy then you cannot understand how you can pick up so many subtle things how you could pick up other people's energies yeah um you don't need to be woo woo yeah it there's enough science to say that we are electromagnetic beings and that there is some sort of energy exchange and highly sensitive people need to learn energy hygiene they need to understand how that works if they want, I don't like to say set boundaries because set boundaries, again, coming from martial arts is like I'm pushing away and keeping away it costs a lot of energy. I'm more about coming back to core, coming back to yourself. And from that space, a lot of energy vampires just won't bother. Yeah. Yeah, There's that's so interesting. Because I've noticed over the years, the more connected for myself that I'm in, and I don't know where I would be on your, um, in your pentagram of where I would show up on things. I'd be interested in doing a separate conversation with you on that. I have some thoughts, ideas, but I know over the years, people say those people never come up to you. And I says, yeah, I don't know. I just put out a vibe like, I don't want that energy near me. Like it's not a resistance. It's just like it doesn't belong here. Um, yeah, it doesn't belong here, and it's, um, how can I say, um, there's exercises I do with people to return to core, to actually know what does it actually feel like if I'm in my body with myself, yeah, um, rather than um, being out there constantly scanning other people in order to be safe or in order to sort of know what's going on. So, um, and in the, in the moment that I return that energy to myself, that I feel myself in my body, um, I don't need to push other people away or tell them to stay away. They feel that. Right. And it takes a lot of effort then, you know, to try and, and get through me or pull because then they need to pull at me. And if I stay in my center, who cares? It's okay. really, it's hard to pull you off center when you're in your center, right? Going back to karate, right? You're grounded. Mm -hmm. It's hard to pull you off center if you're there. You know, yeah, it takes but a as, lot of again, in martial arts or music, it takes a lot of practice if you didn't learn it, you know, at a very young age. Well, that's what I was going to ask you. How can folks begin to practice this coming into themselves? Is there a simple thing we can list, leave our listeners with just as a tiny practice to start hearing and paying attention to themselves? Um, because my other thing is to reach out to you and, and learn more. But beyond that, like someone listening saying, I don't even know what this means for me. So is there something that you would suggest people who are curious and want to look deeper within might start? Yeah, there is one simple thing we, we could, yeah. Um, it's a part of basically an exercise I do at the very beginning. And that is just to try for a moment because you're now deeply engaged, yeah, with me. So your energy is a lot in my field. See if you can actually, you've got your feet on the floor. I will you, now. Now yeah, they're okay. going to bring them up as well. <laughs> so put them on the floor and just slightly press your feet into the floor. 
and then see that when you do that, you can actually feel your sit bones on the chair. Can you? I can. Ever, ever so slightly pull up from your navel, pull up and down at the same time. Just elongate your body without pulling it up. Okay. Okay. And from that space, actually look at me and still feel your feet in your sit bones. Okay. Yeah. Now let go of that and put your awareness, yeah, exactly. Put your awareness back just to me, what kind of glasses I have, my earrings and blah, blah, blah. Yeah. Can you still feel your feet? Uh, absolutely. Good. That, most people will say no. Yeah, they completely go out of the body. They are just somewhere else. So a very easy exercise, let's say you're with a person that is really, what's the English word, pulling you, yeah, pulling your energy or um, giving you problems. Yeah, it's getting too close, it's overwhelming, overreaching. Feel your feet on the ground. Elongate your body. If you're sitting down, feel your sit bones. And you will immediately be more empowered. Oh, yeah, it feels totally different. Yeah, it feels totally different. And really, I've done that, you know, at parties. You know what women are like. Yeah, you are an old women party. I mean, it's a, it's a snake nest, right? And well, I used to Man, you're a brave gal going to a snake nest party. <laughs> well, anyway, a lot of times it's a snake's nest. So, yeah. Um, and I used, I used to get, you know, be so tired and so all over the place and so overwhelmed. And then I actually, you know, when I learned this, I tried this. And it was so much fun because <laughs> it was just like, it was a completely different conversation. Yeah. It came, people reacted completely different to me. And it was just this very small thing. I returned to my, to self simply by using that body cue of feeling the floor and elongating and taking a deep breath. So, you know, folks that are listening, try it out. It's a very simple thing, but it can it can really start a different way of being in the world as a highly sensitive person. Well, and I would add to that, if someone wants to be playful with it, the next time you're in a meeting and you're feeling like your voice is not heard, just practice it because my bet would be whoever's facilitating the meeting is going to feel an energy shift in you and they will come and look at you because because that's just what happens. All of a sudden your energy is fully present and you're not projected out into other people. And here it's like, Sarah, do you have something you'd like to add? Well, as a matter of fact, I do. Mm -hmm. That's a very good way of putting it, Sarah. You just put it really, really well that then you are present yeah, and available. and. The, the, the really important thing is, and again, that comes also from dance, is slightly press your feet into the ground because that's like saying hello to the ground. I'm here. I am here. This is me and I'm here. So it's not just about feeling your feet on the ground. It's actually exerting a little bit of energy, like soft energy into the ground. Yeah. No, I like and that. Discussion. Supported then. You feel supported as well. Exactly. That's well, the energy is going to be connected to the earth, right? Yeah, exactly. I didn't yeah. want to go up, but I'm thinking, yeah, that happens when you, which is one of the reasons why when you're like having a freak out moment, again, not therapeutic language, but, you know, oftentimes people say go out. If there's grass near you, take your shoes off and feel the grass, stand up, like just feel your body, like that connection, like you're saying, the push down, breathing. So, but you're right, that's so simple and we can all do it. It's very simple. It's not simple and easy for people who have trauma. Um, so I have to give that caveat. Um, a lot of people that have trauma, me included a long time ago, they will say, yeah, but I went, you know, I went to that patch of grass and it was nice, but it didn't change anything <laughs> because we are so uncomfortable in our bodies. But in the moment that you actually slightly push into the ground and you establish that motivation or will or desire to connect, it starts to talk to your body rather than having that body that says I'm going to pull away because I'll be overwhelmed I can't handle any more input 
And then you said, though, that one of the things is when we start getting that motivation, we will go towards what we want versus being pushed by some external thing saying you should do blah, blah, blah. It's like we're not doing it, right? Versus going, I want more of this. Exactly. And we're motivated to go in that direction. Exactly. Yeah. Yeah. I want more connection with my body. I want to feel my body as something else than a pain or a stress or a problem for myself or others. That's a trajectory, not fixing, fixing your problem. Yeah, it's falling. So hopeful too. Yeah, yeah. Fall in love with your body and your talents and your abilities. That's what it is about. Well, when when you are told or people say we have to fix you, there's something inherently wrong with you. I'm thinking, says who? You know, says who? You. Yeah, says who? Who says who? Who made you king or queen of the universe? You know. So, yeah. uh, you know, whatever. Yeah, I give these days is, is that so? Is that, oh, I like it. Is that so? It's a so little less aggressive than says, than when I say says who? Or really, you're not the boss of me. That's my, that's, that's what I'm really feeling like a little kid. You're not the boss of me. Says who? Um, but Yuli, you mentioned Misha a little bit earlier. So let's come back and share with our, um, listeners and folks who've been listening for a while will recognize this, but this is a part of the interview interview, I get so excited I just forget to enunciate, um, where I ask our guest, Yoli in this case, to share something she learned from a previous guest and what stood out to her about that. It's our pay it forward and give props to other people who are out there sharing their own light in the world. Yeah, I mean, there would be so much to say about that podcast. I mean, I don't think we have enough time. Um, but I think the one thing that he said that, you know, apart from me saying, oh, man, this is so close to my approach, and I'm so happy to hear that somebody's taking that into the business world and that he's talking about joy and truth and his approach to um, to, life, to art and science. So actually, no, there are two things that I might want to mention. And one is when he mentioned the quiet voice inside, that point when he was in that meeting and he tried to silence that silent that that silent voice and what then he calls that moment of truth and he couldn't and i think that we as highly sensitive people have so much of that quiet voice inside of us and we keep stuffing it down because we are told that it's woo woo crazy or not important a man that is more important than you could ever imagine listening to that quiet voice and, and those moments of truth that you actually feel. And then to base decisions on that heartfelt, um, quiet voice. So that was one. And the other thing was that, and I quote, every art has science in it. You need to understand the art. You need to understand art to extract the science. And I just love that because, you know, being a scientist and an artist, I just thought, yeah, 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 he's completely right. And to, and the way he acknowledged that as a fact, he didn't discuss it. And he just said, yeah, that's the way it is. And I was like, yeah, I should have had those guts a long time ago. <laughs> Put it plainly. So, well, he got his guts when he was in the middle of that meeting and listened to his voice, right? So we all get there in our own time. Um, but that such a great reminder. He was a great guest, and I love that you pulled those two pieces out from him. So, and folks, if you don't know, she's speaking about Misha Rubin, and um, he's a Thrive. fairly recent yeah. Yeah. episode. Yeah, it's called Thrive at Work with Misha Rubin. Okay, so check that out in our in our podcast list. It, it was a fun interview, and I really enjoyed Misha as well. So, Yuli. Um, I have two requests for you. I would love to have you come back as a guest again, and we'll dive in. But um, for folks who don't know, and I'm not sure the sequence in which we are going to um, air this episode, but I actually want to do a three-way conversation with Yoli and another guest who we haven't released, um, Tamara Rozier. And I think that would be a dynamic um, and super interesting conversation because you share similar things, but divergent things. And especially the way I'm thinking, there are some similarities that I think would be super fun for you guys to get to 
talk about and bring in. So um, I'll circle back with you on that. And I know that I will get to work with you in the professional realm on some other topics, and I'm super excited about that as well. I guess I'm just excited about stuff in general. So. Yeah, yeah. It's not the joy of life. I mean, having these conversations and sharing and learning, um, I think creativity has so much to do with learning. And when I talk to you, I learn a lot. <laughs> I'm really looking forward to that session um, that you mentioned about, um, you know, talking three people. Yeah, well, we'll do it. I'll reach out to Tamara and let her know it's it's cooking in our minds and see if she's up for it. Um, yeah. But now that I think about it, when you said I could answer that question for joy, because being able to interview people has been my great joy. And I ever since I was a kid, I would talk all the time and I would go up to strangers and talk. So perhaps that is my joy. See, see, it wasn't that hard, was it? Evidently not. So this would be the one thing I wouldn't give up. And we talk about it on a business basis. Do you want to keep doing the podcast? Heck yeah. So fun to meet all these great people. Yeah. Let's do it. So, See? so that's your Martha Graham moment. <laughs> there we go. Me and doing Martha. It. You're doing it, Sarah. <laughs> okay, Yuli. We'll um, be back in touch. I'll let you know when this goes and have a great rest of your evening because I know it's late there. Thank you very much, Sarah, for this opportunity and talk to you soon. All right. All right. Bye bye. Bye. You've been listening to the No Labels, No Limits podcast with best-selling author, change agent, and strategic vision coach, Sarah Box. You can grab the show notes and find out how to work with Sarah at sarahbox.com forward slash No Labels, No Limits podcast. We'd love this podcast to reach as many people as possible. So please remember to rate, leave a five-star review, and share the podcast with someone you think would get value from this conversation. Until next time, keep taking those daily action steps to align your purpose to your principles and achieve your goals in business and life.